Welcome back to the Name Redacted Podcast, America's most beloved podcast, the most downloaded Red Sox podcast in the world. It is, uh, this should be holiday break week, but it's not because Tyler is, is team no days off. Jake is team no days off. I'm team no days off. Pat is every day off. Uh, Pete is some days off. Uh, and Coley doesn't work here. So um, he's not here. I feel like Coley is kind of like at this point, Coley's like a, it's like, you know, something special has to happen to get Coley in the mix. Uh, he's got he's got kids. He's got a wife. He's got a family. He's got a, another job that pays him to make content. So uh, Coley will be reserved for special occasions. Um, but moving forward, uh, this before we get into the because obviously it was a I don't want to say it was a big news week, but we do have the Nathan Avaldi stuff. We do have the Chris Sale rumors. Uh, we Rich Hill signing with the Pittsburgh Pirates. That was fucking that was massive. That sent shockwaves throughout Red Sox Nation as well. Um, we're but never going to recover. Tyler, this is, uh, this is the last episode of 2022. Um, how would you say your first year in, in podcasting has gone with, with this, with the name redacted podcast in particular? I've had a blast. I, I feel like I've had my ups and downs. I've kind of learned what works, what doesn't work. Um, I've realized some of my annoying habits that you like to remind me of constantly, Jared. Uh, a lot of my issues. A lot of pouting. A lot of pouting. That's a see. That's a newer issue, but I'm happy we have moved on from the frustrated era. You heard that? Fr. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't. Some of but. the people will. But overall, mm-hmm. no. It's been a blast. I just wish the Red Sox didn't absolutely suck ass, and then we had this off season on top of it. But we make fun out of it, and that's all we can ask to do. Yeah. Uh. I, so I think I think we're. By the way, ad free episode because this is supposed to be a week off, and we're just powering through because the fucking uh, the people need their Red Sox content. We're here to to provide that for them. I think, I think where I've arrived, I'm I'm kind of leaning towards a like a smidge of, of optimism. Like I, I'm not. I wouldn't even call it optimism. I think I'm in the camp of like, well, let's fucking see. Like I, I don't think. Like there's obviously the Red Sox fans out there. They're like, they might lose 120 games. Uh, there are Red Sox fans who are like, I'm not even going to bother watching. There are some Red Sox fans that are way over the top positive and just it's preposterous how positive they are. But I think where I have arrived, at least right now, at least right now, is let's see. Is that, I, I feel like that's probably the, that, that's the most sane place to be. I feel like if, if you're saying that they're going to lose over 100 games, that's just not going to happen. Uh, if you're one of these like super overly positive, like everything has gone spectacular this offseason, Red Sox fans, you belong in an insane asylum. But I think the right place to be, which is where I have arrived, and I would say in the last week or so, is well, let, let, let's just let's just see because the way that I look at it, right? Yes or no? Bullpen is better. Yes. Uh, a lot of things have to go right for this to be an even passable. Uh, rotation. Correct. But the upside's there. The upside's there. A lot of things have to go right. A lot of improbable things have to go right for this rotation to be passable. But it's still, as of this recording, it's still December. And I feel like the Red Sox have now entered the let's look at the trade market part of the offseason, which we'll talk about. Uh, And then you have the lineup, right? There's not... By the way, last year, with JD, with Bogarts, there was not a lot of thump in this lineup. Now you don't have either of those guys. So I don't like, am I going to say the Red Sox lineup is worse right now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's fair to say after losing JD and Bogarts that, that it is uh, worse. But you could also just kind of spin it and say it's different. It's, it could be good in a different way. Yes. I still think that they, they need that corner. Like we're, we're right back to 2011 when Theo Epstein was creaming his jeans over Adrian Gonzalez. Like they needed that cornerstone number three hitter for the next eight years that obviously ended up being a year and a half. I think we're there again. Uh, you know, 2017 when you lose David Ortiz after 2016 and it was that one year in between where it's like we need that one guy. JD Martinez was that one guy and he ended up being that guy for. I don't want to say all five years, um, three, three and a half of those years, he was that guy. Uh, so I think we're there again where we're going to see that it's, it's, it's a good lineup. 
they're going to score runs, but they're, you're going to need that. Like we were just obviously very fortunate to have David Ortiz from 2003 to 2016 and then only had to go 2017 uh, with no one. And then you right back in it with, with JD Martinez being the guy. But I, th- I think where I arrive on the Red Sox lineup is you need the thump. But there's also a lot of uh, good at bats in there. Like there's a lot of plate patience. There's a lot of strike zone awareness. There's a lot of bat to ball skill in there. And I feel like you're just kind of describing Yoshida as, as, as a whole. But I think that there's a lot of that in the lineup. So additions still have to be made. Like I'm not going to say, you know, the, that I'm optimistic about this team as it stands on December 29th. But I don't think that any team is complete on December 29th. So I'm still waiting to see what happens. But for what they are today, I agree with the sentiment that's on some corners of Red Sox Twitter right now where fans are like, I think we're all down on the team because because Xander's gone. But there are other moves that have been made and there are other pieces that were already in place that should give you some reason to be like, well, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I think that is the right take. If you go on Red Sox Twitter right now, this is... The worst team ever. People are already saying, you know, I'm ready to relive 2012. You know, let's get a top five pick, whatever, top seven pick. That's not, it's not that bad. I think people are upset based on the expectations, right? When you go into an offseason and the main lines are, you know, Xander Bogarts is priority A. We're planning to spend money. You went over the luxury tax, so it looks like you're going to try to go over the luxury tax again because that's what we see across the sport. Well, no. When your plan A and Xander Bogarts ends up falling through the ground and you kind of have to figure it out on the figure it out on the go, this is where you end up. Now, are they going to be a horrendous team? No. Like you said, the profile, the bullpen, without a doubt, considerably better. That's probably what sunk this team outside of injuries the most last year. The rotation, I get it. Be upset, but you're in that same position you were in 2021 or 2013, where someone has to step up. You really need multiple arms to step up, but you see the out or the upside. It's just when you compare this team to the 2021 year or the 2013 year, there was more of a foundation there. And I think that's where some of this worry and fear is justified. It's like you don't have Dustin Pedroia, John Lester, David Ortiz, like you did in 2013, where it was like, all right, you know, we still have this core. We just got to kind of fill it out the right way. 2021 was Xander, JD, Nate, all these other parts. Now it's more like, all right, you got Raffy. Right. And then everything else is kind of all right. Let's hope Trevor Story has a career year. I think Turner for JD's a wash. I'd call them very even. I just think Turner fits a little bit better. But you're hoping Yoshida becomes that guy here in Boston. It's a big ask. Tristan Casas has to have a huge rookie year. You know, you need Brian Bayo in the rotation to pitch something like a mid rotation guy. Corey Kluber needs to step into kind of a mid rotation role. Chris Sale needs to actually pitch. James Paxson actually needs to pitch. It just feels like those versions of those teams with more question marks. Which not everything's gonna be. Are we getting hyped? Big Jared? time breaking news. Oh no. December 29th at 5 25 p.m. The New what? York Yankees have made a monster addition to their bullpen. They have signed former Red Sox legend dipshit <laughs> Danish. Wow. Okay. Oh, Red yeah. Sox offseason is going pretty good. That's, could be worse. Fucking, could that's huge. That's huge. Dipshit Danish <laughs> belongs to the New York Yankees. Uh, John Amon, dipshit Danish to the Yankees. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, at least, you know, the Red Sox, if the Yankees have Tyler Danish, that immediately makes the Red Sox better because the Red Sox had Tyler Danish <laughs> on their team last year and they were worse. Um, but yeah, as we were saying, it's a team with a lot of question marks. The picture's not done. We're halfway through the offseason. <laughs> we got six weeks until spring training. So there will be additions. They need a you know, number three type hitter here, clearly, but it's just not going to be the year many thought it was. You're back to 2021 instead of going into 2022 when it felt like your window for a championship open. It's tough. It's not great, but you know, you're not the worst team in all of baseball. Yeah. I mean, I just, I love that his nickname is dipshit Danish and he's (laughs) now at the Yankees. Like, I don't, I think, I don't even know why, like we started calling him that. Like he, I, for all, for all I know, he's a pretty nice guy. 
I think I was down. It was when Brian Johnson came back to visit over the summer and he went to BP and then he came over to the Red Sox dugout with me and we were sitting there and Dipshit was one of the guys that came out to talk to him. So he seems like a nice guy. I don't know how he got the nickname Dipshit Danish, but absolutely outstanding that he he ended up with the Yankees. That's going to be very fun if he makes it to the big league club. We're rooting for Dipshit. Am I wrong? Now, this is off memory and I was on vacation. Wasn't he the one on 628 that absolutely shit the bed? It, it, wasn't that Tyler Danish's finest moment? Was that in <laughs> April that I'm thinking of where he came in and they were like, try to close out this six out save for us. And he just got absolutely obliterated to the worst level. I don't remember like a good dipshit Danish out. Oh, like, there, I don't there remember was one time that he went out there and I was like, this guy, he's kind of like the real deal. No, as bad as the Red Sox bullpen was, there was like a two week stretch around the time Shriver came out because they were around that same time where we were like <laughs> Tyler Danish in the seventh inning. OK, he's getting some outs for us. And then we learned who dipshit Danish was. Oh, it was. It was 628. Was it? You're looking at it right now. Yeah. One inning. He gave up uh, two earned runs. And that was yeah, that was really the end of Tyler Danish. The numbers tanked after that. He got the loss that day. Rough scene. That was a really, yeah, it was Tyler Danish, him and Hansel Robles. That's crazy. <laughs> I don't think your positivity is bad, though. I think for at least wait to be negative until the off season's completely done. Then I don't even think that, like I said, I, I don't think I'm, I'm optimistic either. Like I, I, um, I think being in a position to say, well, let's see what happens is about as optimistic as you can be. And I, I don't want to be in a spot where it's like, oh, you got bullied into being positive. No, 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 no. I just uh, adding Kluber, which by the way, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Um, you don't have sources, Jared. Yeah, thank you don't you. have real sources. I don't That's have what sources, the people are telling uh, me. Mm -hmm. Can, yep. Jared, thank I you. hope you don't mind me revealing this. I'm probably taking it a step too far. You wouldn't want me to do this, but there, there was some message in uh, Jerry mm -hmm. Scoop shop the night before mm -hmm. that the deal the with Kluber before. was done. Yep. 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 I, uh, I'm sorry Jerry to air Scoop out shop. that. Jerry Scoop shop had uh, Corey Kluber to the Boston Red Sox the night before it uh, was made public. Um, but, you know, I, people, people were catching on to Jerry Scoop shop. People were like, what the fuck? We need to, you know, we, they want to get in there. Can't, can't happen. It's very, very exclusive. You wouldn't benefit from it at all because the whole point of Jerry Scoop Shop is you can't talk about Jerry Scoop Shop. Like those takes are in there. Those, those scoops are in there. Uh, and everyone has kind of sworn to secrecy. So if you were a Red Sox fan and you were in the Scoop Shop, like, yeah, you might know about it, but you can't say anything about it. So we just, you can't, you can't trust a lot of people to be in there and, and to, to keep it tight to the vest. So um, Jerry Scoop Shop had it first. Um, but Corey Kluber on a one-year deal for $10 million with an option for a second year? Yeah, club option for a second year. If he hits every escalator, it can equal like two years, 27 in total. But it's a lot of you know innings pitched and the game started. Yeah, okay. Uh, instant reaction to this. And this is coming off the heels of Nathan Avaldi signing with the Texas Rangers, which... I kind of figured was going to happen. So this was this goes back to the uh, Jacob Degrom to the Rangers premonition that I had, where I I kind of like heard about some of this stuff while the season was still going on. Uh, I heard that the Rangers wanted uh, Degrom. I heard that they wanted Ovaldi. I heard that they wanted Waka, who's still out there. I heard that they wanted Rich Hill, who signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates. So Walk is still out there. I still think that maybe the Baltimore Orioles are the team that could be the front runner for Michael Waka. Um, but I am not in the least bit surprised that Nathan Avaldi ended up signing there. And Chad Jen Chad Jennings had a story about this. What was what was the what was the exact thing that he reported? His main nugget was that a three year guaranteed deal was on the table at some point that the Red Sox offered that to him. It didn't give a date or when it was, but there was a three-year guaranteed offer on the table. Right. So I was, I was throwing around this theory that 
because there were reports in like November that the Red Sox were talking to him about an extent. Who had that? Was that like Pepin? Uh, no, I think that was Spear. Spear had it right after he turned down the QO. It was like the Red Sox and him are working out a multi-year deal. Uh, and it was in a very positive tone. Like it should get done. It looks like they're both kind of on the same page. It's more working out the numbers. But as we've said for the last couple of weeks, as every single week passed, it just felt more unlikely. So what would make the most sense would be that the Red Sox made him the offer in November and then they moved on. And I, I don't know that the report is out there that the offer was, was... Was the offer still on the table? Did Jennings say, is the offer still on the table? And he just chose the one with Texas? Because that detail is very important in the grand scheme of things. If, if the offer was still on the table and he signed with Texas, then I'm confused. But if the offer was made in November... And then he signed almost in January, then logic would tell you that the Red Sox made him an offer early and he thought he could do better so that it just didn't work out that way. Then he overplayed his hand a little bit. I'm digging through the the article right now. Let's see. Let's see. But hold on. I want to know like the exact phrasing because that that detail is very important. Was the Red Sox offer still on the table at the time that he signed with the Texas Rangers? Uh, but regardless, I, I think it goes without saying Nathan Avaldi uh, going to the Texas Rangers is um, I think I think you have the more casual fans that are like, what the fuck? Like, they want to keep every single player that that won a ring in 2018. Uh, then you have some of the more analytical fans that are looking at the velocity numbers and they're looking at everything else. And what I tweeted essentially was, you can still be upset that Nathan Avaldi is signing with the Texas Rangers and understand that Corey Kluber had a better season than Avaldi last year. Statistically speaking, he was better. Uh, both guys are guys that, are injury risks. So Nate very well could have a healthy season next year. Kluber could have a shit season next year in terms of health and production. So, uh, you know, both guys healthy. I think what it, what it boiled down to to me, and someone actually made this point because we were talking about it on a previous episode. Kluber could end up having the better statistical season than Evaldi. But if the Red Sox, by the grace of God, made the playoffs next year, who would you want on the mound in game one? I think everyone is still saying Evaldi because you, you, you know, it is what it is in, in that regard. But uh, I think uh, there, there's a decent amount, if not a slight majority of Red Sox fans who are okay with saying, thank you for 2018. You're a legend here. Best of luck in Texas. But it was time to move on, which was which, which a very similar sentiment to when JD went to the Dodgers. So the wording from Jennings, another person with direct knowledge of the negotiation, said the Red Sox had offered Evaldi a three-year guarantee earlier this month. That too never came to fruition. In December? Yes, this month. This was, yeah, it came out two, three days ago. Okay. Um, now, what I would say is for those who are worried about the velocity, that bring that up. The fact that the Red Sox put a three-year deal on the table for him that was guaranteed at any point this offseason, and nobody knows Nate's medicals better than the Red Sox. He's been in the organization for multiple years, and this is a guy we know with his elbow issues, multiple Tommy John surgeries, the bone spur surgery back in 2019. All that plays into it. I just, I think if you're looking at Kluber and Evaldi, they're different tiers of pitchers at this point in their careers. With Evaldi, you have that 2021 upside to say, hey, if he is himself, he can start game one and be that dog and be the ace they needed in 2021. Like we're sitting here crossing our fingers with all these lottery tickets and Chris Sale, James Paxson, hoping Whitlock or Bayo clicks this year and can, you know, take that next step forward. We had seen Evaldi do it last calendar year. And is this year, obviously, he dealt with the injuries, still had a 3-8 ERA, but the FIP was in the fours, was giving up a ton of hard contact in that sense. I think with Corey Kluber, the guy you should compare him to isn't Nate Evaldi. It's Michael Walker. And Michael Walker is not a true top of the rotation guy. He pitched like it to some level last year with that ERA, but we looked at the fifth and we remembered it was 414. What he excelled at was just easy, not hard contact again and again. And if you look at the baseball savant page, Kluber, 75th percentile hard hit percentage. Walker was 70th or 70th. You kind of go down 80th percentile average exit velo. Walker was 56th percentile. 
Kluber's FIP was 357. So we're talking a better FIP than Waka had. I think they kind of looked at it, and we mentioned this a couple episodes ago. So much went Waka's way in terms of BABIP and left on base luck. It seems like Kluber was a little more unlucky. Now you're taking the same injury risk. Both guys have a ton on their side. But I think they're looking at and saying, hey, we got the best out of Waka. He wants multiple years. We're not doing that. We can probably get similar production out of Kluber, and we only have to guarantee one year. It's a settle. It's without a doubt a settle. You should be upset that someone like Nate isn't here because he offers top of the rotation upside. I think for Kluber, if everything goes right, maybe he gives you number three numbers, but it's a more of a back end arm at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> Not going to walk a, a lot of guys. Just, like, it feels like there's a missing piece to the puzzle here because if the Red Sox made an offer to Nathan Avaldi for three years at the beginning of December and Avaldi is on the record saying, I want to retire here. Like, I, like he went to the team and said, same thing as Xander. I want to be here. Um, I want to retire here. Like this is where I want to be. And then he signs with the Rangers for a lesser deal. Like, are we talking a difference of average annual value with Texas, or was the offer not on the table anymore? Like that—that's the missing piece of the puzzle here that would kind of paint the picture of what actually happened and why he's not here. Uh, because if the if the priority is to stay, and there was a three year offer, and he signed for what two? Yeah, two with the. Third year vesting option. If he pitches 300 innings the next two years, it's worth 20 million. Okay. So then maybe the, maybe the money was better. I don't know. We don't know what the dollars were for the Red Sox. Um, you also have the angle. I, I agree with you that he wanted to stay here. Texas is home for him. So, you know, maybe yeah. that's not as crazy of a move on his part. And at the same time, is it crazy to look at it and say, well, I don't think the Rangers are going to be competing in the ALS with the likes of the Astros or even the Mariners. Right now, the vibes are so low here. A lot of the guys he was here with are gone. Is he just at the point where it's like, JD is gone, you know, Xander's gone. Really, the crew, the core, I was here when I got dealt. Pulecki's gone. I got dealt here. Like Pulecki, his boy, who he stood up for in September. Like, yep. is it just, all right, it looks like my time here or this chapter's closed. I'm going to move on to something that's new and exciting and arguably the biggest storyline of the offseason. Yeah, I mean, if I were him... It's like, yeah, like I want to stay here. I love Boston, yada, yada. But you love the group of guys. It's you can love the city. Sure. Fine. But if you put yourself in Nathan of all these shoes, it's like, well, to Tyler's point, all my boys are gone at this point. It's, it's uh, Alex Cora. I can like go Alex home. Cora. I mean, he lo- like the, the front office people. They fucking love Nate. Like they gush about Nate class just everything that you would want in a player in your organization like i i've heard it all from front office people talking about nate like they fucking love this guy and but again put yourself in his shoes all your friends are gone you can geographically go home quote unquote home i mean texas is massive like you can you can be in texas and still be nine hours away from where you actually fucking grew up uh so he but he gets to go back to texas and if I'm a right-handed pitcher, I would love to share a rotation with Jacob deGrom. I would love, even if I'm in my 30s, to be able to pick his brain and be a teammate with that guy. And, and obviously, the Rangers having last offseason, they spend on Simeon and Seager. Then they go out and get deGrom. But that's a place where you may not look at the team and the division they're in and say, World Series or bust. But the mindset of go for it is there. And it is not here. Where, where you're saying that you want to be. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I guess it really doesn't matter in the end. Like, it's not like he signed with the fucking Pittsburgh Pirates. Like, that is just you're signing because that's the team that's going to give you a big league contract. Like, Nathan Evaldi is going to a place where it's, it's exciting what they're doing there. And I, I would throw in, like, for people who want to mention the contract, it's a reasonable deal. Like, this isn't crazy money and he had the QO attached to him. So, obviously, that, you know, complicated his market and everything. But, if you were a Red Sox fan and he got that money, you would have been like, oh, yeah, th- that's just about what he, he deserved there. My question is, if this deal, per se, earlier in December or no, or in November, they took it off the table or weren't as interested now, is it them looking at the entire season and saying, well, before Xander Bogarts, we were interested because we were going to go over the luxury tax and we were willing to kind of push in and say, yeah, we want to compete this year. We want to be one of the big dogs. Now that Xander Bogarts is left, and I think most of us are at this point where we believe they're not going to go over the luxury tax, do they say, it's not worth it? We're, we're not going to put this kind of investment risk on the books right now because 
you know, we like Evaldi, but we realize there are, you know, a decent amount of red flags there. There's a real risk. Are we going to go the safer route with Corey Kluber, who, yeah, he can't reach the same ceiling, but, you know, he should give us fine numbers. He should fill the rotation spot, bring some of the leadership Evaldi would have brought here to help mentor the Bayos and the Whitlocks of the world. And that's where they currently stand. Where it's just like, yeah, yeah. We're, we're not going to give 17 million to you when we can get Kluber for 10 and bridge instead of trying to rise. Yeah. Jake, how do you feel about Nate not being here next year? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what you guys said. Like, it's always tough to see your boys go. Um, just did so much for us in 18 and was a legend here. But I mean, it's not like I don't see it as a massive loss and I, I don't hate the Kluber signing either. It, it's yeah. like, I think it's just a tough loss in terms of context because it's just like what was left. He was the last arm you could say had top of the rotation upside. That's yeah. it. So now you realize the Red Sox have told you, yeah, we're not signing a top of the rotation arm. What we told you a month ago that we were looking at one to two number two types that we felt like were the Red Sox or felt the Red Sox needed to slot everyone in the right spot in the rotation. Bullshit slash changing a plan slash your plan A got completely blown up in your face. Yeah, that's what that looks like. And I think this goes back to where we started. You got to look through the lens of this upcoming year differently. This isn't a championship year. It's just not. You're back to where you were in 2021, where it's about figuring out the foundation again. And then maybe hoping everything goes right like it did in 2021 feels impossible because you have more question marks. But you hope a year from now, you're looking at Whitlock and Bayo. Devers, Casas, and you're like, oh no, there's the foundation. Let's add and pour the money in. Now, will Heim still have a job at that point? Fair question. Very fair question. But I will tell you, if he's not planning to go over the luxury tax this year, that should tell you something about his job security. Yeah. I, I uh, yeah. There's just, it's a lot of ifs. It's a lot of ifs. Way and too many. I can many. see the vision with, uh, like, if they pay Devers, which is still a long shot at this point. Like Bayo and uh, Casas and you know Meyer. Two years from now, it's like yeah, like okay, yeah. You want to like stretch it down, but this is this is the Boston Red Sox. Like people don't want to fucking wait around for five goddamn years just for a team that has a shot. You know what I mean? Uh, so it, I think it, to your point too, there's a lot of Plan Bs going on. A lot of Plan Bs. Like you can't tell me. That the Red Sox wanted Corey Kluber instead of Nathan Evaldi. You can't tell me oh. that they wanted Trevor Story at shortstop instead of Xander Bogarts. I feel like they just overplayed their hand in a, in a couple of different scenarios, and now you're just you're left with a lot of Plan B options that you know your Plan A's are playing in other organizations right now. Well, because the reality is, as we've talked about with this Bogarts situation, how we we've talked about your sourcing that day, Jared, and what you were hearing. It's pretty clear the Red Sox were at 6160 or 6162. Spears moved the number back and forth depending on what podcast he's been on. But the other offers were about seven, 200, somewhere eight, maybe even a little bit more. Well, the Red Sox thought they were going to throw an extra year on top. And then at the end of the day, we were all going to be in the same ballpark. Bogarts was going to end up back here because, you know, he wasn't going to move unless someone put a ridiculous offer. AJ Preller ultimately did that. And now the Red Sox are sitting here and they're like, fuck. We were actually, we had changed our minds based on spring training when we bullshitted him and put us in our, in this spot, which is a major mistake from this front office. There's no doubt about that, but they had realized the importance of keeping him here. June Lee has confirmed that report as well. And they've just been scattering and go down the list. You want to talk about plan B for Corey Kluber? No offense, dude, buddy, you're plan D. You're, you're like Andrew Heaney told us to fuck off. Zach Evelyn told us to fuck off. We put three years on the table for Evaldi at one point. He told us to fuck off uh, or, you know, maybe the deal wasn't on the table anymore. That's probably a better way to put it. But that's where they are. And that's where you realize a team that goes from, hey, we really want to compete this year to, all right, we just got to be realistic. We got to look around and say, is there, we don't want to trade the top three guys in our farm system. We're allegedly holding on to Rafaela very tightly here. Those are your top four prospects. You can't make a super impact trade that way, even if you are moving Hauk. Verdugo, Pavetta, in some combination of moves, there, there's just a cap on what this team can be. So, all right, let's treat it like 2021 or 2013. 2021 is probably the better comp and say, let's hope someone like Yoshida clicks. He proves he can be part of that foundation like Hunter Renfro did at that time. Obviously, he got dealt like Kike did at that time where it's like, oh, this guy can be you know, a main fixture on our team for a hot minute here. That, it's out the window. 
Yeah. And I yeah. think the Red Sox look at it at this point and they're just saying, I, I, I respect them instead of just making dumbass moves. Like th- this is a kind of a realization of the trade deadline. If you look at it, they were delusional thinking that team was going to go to the playoffs. Everyone on this podcast, if you, we said it at the time, we were hopeful, whatever, but we didn't believe that team was going anywhere. Even if you mm-hmm. thought they were going to get in the playoffs, did you have championship aspirations? No. I guess you could use the Phillies and say, well, who thought the Phillies were going to go to the World Series? Well, they had, I don't know. I, I think you look and momentum switch for them with the firing of Joe Girardi. They had different things going their way. The Red Sox started low, had that peak, and then it was just downhill all the way after. That's part of evaluating. And you just look, now of all the leaving, it's compounding mistakes here. Like you enter 2022 by going a couple million over the luxury tax, which you're not supposed to do in years you go over the luxury tax. You blow by it because you're pushing for a championship. But hey, you gave yourself the back door. The back door was there. If this all blows up in our face, we can get under and we won't set ourselves back. Well, you double down on it at the trade deadline when you could have moved Evaldi. It's been reported recently that a team was willing to take JD, the, all the money. They would have taken him. You wouldn't have gotten anything the back. Oh, the there Dodgers. you go. Uh, so mm-hmm. there you go. A team was willing to take him and you could have slipped under. You kind of spit in the face of that and said, screw it. We believe in this dying team for some reason, despite not oh. helping the bullpen. And, and the then- counter to that, the counter to that is I think we all forget that at the time of the trade deadline, <clears throat> the Red Sox were two games back of, of a wild card spot. Two games. I think when we look back on this season and how things went, it's easy to forget that at the time of the trade deadline that Nathan Avaldi was hurt. So he was basically damaged goods. So there weren't a lot of suitors. Um, and even JD's market was not that great. And so you would have, like, everyone's like, oh, you could have got something for him. You're probably better off getting a draft pick for Nathan Avaldi leaving than whatever prospect was coming back. Uh, because well, now going over the, the like the draft pick obviously drops, but and that's JD's where you market, fuck yourself. Yeah, like you weren't it, it, gonna get anything no. of value for JD. You just weren't. I would have. T- I didn't want anything. You could have sent me one baseball. I would have taken a fucking baseball. Just take the money so you can get under and not put yourself in a spot where you came into this off season and you didn't want to talk to anybody who had a qualifying offer attached to them. But Heim you was fucked yourself- either way. Heim was fucked either way because either he. Like the rea- if he if he traded JD Martinez to get under the tax, and it was proven like, hey, this is this trade is to get under the tax. It's not to make this team better right now. Is it? What would the reaction have been, dude? This is fucking Boston. We don't fucking wave the white flag at the trade deadline with two games out. What the fuck? And then, or he quote unquote, he doesn't really go for it, but he keeps the core intact, and it's like, all right. Let's, you know, let's see what these guys can do in the second half here. Uh, we're only two games out. Let's see what we can do. Like, we're going to get healthy. We're going to get Chris Sale, this and that. And it just didn't happen that way. Like, JD it, sucked it, the rest of the way. Chris Sale, obviously, what that. happened with him. Yeah, JD I mean, sucked for like, a month before that. Like, I, I hate correct. to put it in this situation, but that's the front office's job. I don't give a fuck what the PR was or whatever. Like, you're, fit, you're eating the PR right now. They say they don't care. It's your job to evaluate. And I think a majority of fans, including us at the time, did not have faith in this team figuring it out. Because when you, mm-hmm. even with these pieces you brought in, did you fix the bullpen? No, you didn't fix mm-hmm. the bullpen. You had Whitlock coming back and now, or he had just came back, whatever it was. But we still didn't believe in that team at the time. You shouldn't be a fringe team in a year you go over the luxury tax. That's the problem here. When you go over the luxury tax, that's a championship caliber window you're opening up and your team was not properly put in that position. And you didn't address it at the beginning of the year. Okay, you kept that. As, why else did you only go $4 million over? It was so if things got wrong, went wrong, you could get underneath it. Things went wrong and you doubled down on your failures. And now you have a situation where you didn't maximize your... You have things to guys departing and you're not getting the proper returns for them. You know, instead of picks in the 70s for Bogarts and Evaldi, you now have picks in the 130s for them. Those mm-hmm. are significant differences when it comes to the draft pool and some of the flexibility you have in that department. It's just you have kind of compounding failures over and over again. Like, why, if this was the case where you believed in this team so much after not performing the way they needed to the first four months of the season or whatever? or yeah, the first four months of the season or whatever, 
why did you double down? Like you didn't believe enough to push well beyond the luxury tax at the beginning of the year. But for some reason, over those four months where they didn't perform, you bought in and you're like, oh, no, this team, this team right here. But coming off a year in 2021 where you were two games away from the World Series, you went four million over and said, eh, fuck it. We don't need a DH or Mm -hmm. we don't need a right fielder. Excuse me, not a DH. We don't need a right fielder. We'll have Travis Shaw playing first base with Bobby Delbeck and our bullpen, which we all knew needed help. They said, eh, whatever. We'll kind of figure it out and hope, you know, once Chris Sale went down and out got pulled out, we'll kind of tape it together. It's just the logic doesn't make sense. There, there's some, and this is where I think people come back and say the lack of a plan. Your, your logic, like it's one thing if things add up and you can see, it's like, no, you obviously didn't believe in this team enough at the beginning of the year to go well beyond the luxury tax. You put that escape in your backpack. Well, when you had a chance to pull the escape because things went wrong, like you thought were possible, You doubled down on it and you still could have kept Xander here. And I think the issue was not that they didn't buy or whatever. It was the lack of direction. If you told Xander and said, hey, I'm being real, this team just isn't it. I think even him in his heart of hearts would have understood, okay, at least there's a plan. There's a direction. Xander said there's a lack of direction. I think that's where the the conversation continues to happen. It's like, no, you, you didn't really improve the team at the deadline, which was already on life support. And those luxury tax complications have created this offseason where things have gone even worse in your favor, where you stayed away from QO guys, guys that you really needed on this roster because you didn't want to give up two picks for them. And then the departing assets you did have, you got less than what you should have. Like it, Those are compounding failures again. And I think that's where I look at Heim Bloom like, and listen, I'm not calling him a nerd. I'm a fucking nerd. But the nerds are supposed to be greater with man- or with asset management and realizing the finer details. That's what people like me killed Dave Nabrowski for. Heim isn't showing that recently. He isn't showing that with Thad Ward when it came to the Rule 5 draft where he's the first pick in the Rule 5 draft and you couldn't turn that into anything. Jeter Downs got claimed by the Nationals, the first team on the waiver wire. Another guy, you just kind of DFA'd. You have to be able to get something for some of these assets. The whole Hoy Park situation. Was Hoy Park worth this? W- worth that ward basically being worth nothing? Like you're going to get he what? He actually just K? got designated again last night. He's been, he's been exactly. with like five different organizations just this offseason. It's just there has not been great 40 man roster management in the luxury tax. And that's why when I went on radio the day after the deadline and everyone was like, oh, well, whatever. And eh. I was like, the luxury tax, that is the first time. And you can miss on trades. I believe that some of the greatest front office guys have. And Heim deserves you know, plenty of blame for some of those misses. When it comes to the luxury tax and stuff, that's where he's supposed to excel. Those visions. That's what Heim Bloom's supposed to be about. And he fucked up that. And that is a failure where if he gets fired in June or July, that will be maybe number one on the list. Number two, if you consider the Bogart situation or whatever it is. But that's what the nerds are supposed to be good at. And he failed with the lack of vision there. It's just like everyone wants to say what it was going to be. The majority of people were out on this team. Jared, we are the biggest fucking Red Sox bobos. We are like at the end of the day. And even uh, we were like, eh, this team is just really not it. Hopefully, like we were all hopeful. Like if you turn your head, you close one of your fucking eyes and you kind of don't think about it. You could picture this team going on a run. But if you gave us truth serum, we were all going to say the same thing. This isn't their year. Yeah, this is just not a team that's going to get hot. And, and that's just where I sit there and I'm like, Heim, you're supposed to be able to make these tough decisions. You're supposed to have the evaluation purposes there. You didn't have it there. And it burnt you coming into this offseason. And you didn't get the most out of your departing assets. That shit we gave Dave, to Dave Dombrowski again and again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do see people complaining about some of the additions being made. Uh, this offseason as the players are on the older end. But I mean, who, I don't, I, that doesn't bother me at all. Like you can be 37 years old and still be wildly effective in this league. So I don't, I don't really give a shit about that. Um, but that was my first, that was my first tweet after Nathan Avaldi had signed with the Rangers was this makes this past trade deadline all the more confusing. Um, if you weren't going to heavily pursue guarantee Xander Bogarts, JD, Nathan Avaldi, those guys coming back, 
why the fuck were they still here uh, after the trade deadline? And I get not trading Xander Bogarts. Like, obviously, you're not going to do that. The optics of that would have been horrendous. Trading Xander Bogarts two games out of a playoff spot is just not going to happen. So I'm not advocating for that in hindsight. But in hindsight, yeah, you 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 trade evolved. You trade JD. You trade JD, and that's it. Like that's if, it. If you had a deal with the Dodgers, do it. I don't know what happened there. I don't know like how well, it didn't go through or what I, happened in the end. I, I'll but put my they hand wanted up. JD. I, I'll tell you because they wanted Mark Vientos from the Mets. The fuck are you smoking? What do you think JD no, Martinez? No, no, no. The Dodgers. Is- no, I I know, but we were talking about what the Red Sox at the time with the Mets. The rumors were. They wanted mm-hmm. a Mark Vientos type package for JD mm-hmm. Martinez, who was cooked, absolutely cooked, who was cooked for a majority of the second half the previous season. That JD Martinez, the JD Martinez who was cooked all of 2020, we've seen for the last couple of years, it's a couple strong months at the beginning of the year, and then it falls off a plane. That's where mm-hmm. JD is at this point, and he can no longer play in the field, which diminishes his value even more. There is a struggle of at least reading the market or understanding player worth to some degree going on here. And that's where I look at the Jose Abreu thing a little bit, where your offer wasn't even in the right ballpark. It's just, I haven't loved Heim's ability to read the market. Whether that's a whole front office problem or whatever it is, the Xander Bogart situation, 5-150 would have got it done. And all of this would have been avoided. All of this. You'd be in a totally different spot this offseason. But you read his market so wrong that he felt like he got slapped in the face. Like there's compound, like it's okay to make, you miss a trade, right? You you miss a move here. There's multiple things lining up here that you fucked up on. And that's where I sit here and I'm like, you you can't stack L's like this. You've stacked a lot of L's in 12 months. You know what's crazy is that this this all goes back to John Lester. (laughs) If you really want to go all the way back, yeah. It it does. It does. Like missing on John Lester made you pay David Price. You had to trade Mookie Betts to get rid of the rest of Price's contract to get under the luxury tax. And then you now have the ability to spend and you don't spend on Xander and uh, the Nathan Avaldi contract as well. Like that was another one why they were over. Um, like you talked about like the compounding mistakes, <laughs> like you could make the case that this all goes back to just not paying John Lester in 2014. It, 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 it's true. <laughs> and it's just like, if you had, you could have righted so much of this just by taking care of Xander in spring training, right? You take care of Xander in spring training and you view last off season, even if you just wanted to go a couple million over, it was okay. It was all right. Mm-hmm. Like if you didn't believe in that team enough and you were like, you know, we kind of got rushed. We paid Trevor Story at the end. We don't know if this team is good enough. All right. Pull the fucking cord. Pull it. It's a trade deadline. Just trade JD. If you remove just JD from this roster, it's not making much of a difference. No offense to JD. Mm-hmm. That's just the reality of the player he was at that point. And it, it, it is a different conversation in the locker room. Yes, at least you were picking a direction. You didn't feel directionless, which is what the Red Sox feel like, where they don't know which way they want to go. And you could have kicked that can down the road in terms of figuring out this championship window. Instead, you're in a spot now where it's like, all right, we're in a bridge year. You know what I mean? Now we're kind of at the same point where, you know, we let guys leave and we didn't get as much as we could have back. The franchise feels kind of stuck in between. And we didn't talk to any QO guys because we didn't want to give up the picks for it. So that took you out of a lot of really impactful guys. Mm -hmm. And what are you supposed to do at that point? Yeah, it's not good. Not good. It's not good. And, and that's good. why, like, I, I, I've given so much credit to Heim for 2021 and all the way throughout that year. I can't be okay with him not being fine with the finer details. You're going to miss on trades. I get it. And he's missed on a good amount, you know, too many. But when it comes to the finer details, Heim Bloom can't miss there. That's not what the nerds are about. They excel at that stuff. You know, what do you say? The nerd is messing up on the nerdy stuff. Mm-hmm. And how am I supposed to feel good about the nerd messing up on the nerdy stuff when we haven't seen him excel at the Dombrowski level stuff? Which he, you know, doesn't exactly get as much access to because of John Henry and stuff, but 
you know, we talk the Trevor Story signing or whatever it may be. I mean, John Henry said publicly that he was scaling back on spending. I forgot about that. That was what? That was 2019? Yeah. But he had a press conference where he basically said, you know, it's not going to be the the spending that that's been. That's why he stopped talking. Because when he said that, it bl- got blown up and he was like, John Henry's being too honest. You know, he, he's kind of just telling you like, we don't want to spend like this. Like, it's great. We did it because we fell in the fucking hole with Ben Charrington at the end. But this is not how we want to live. We want to live like the Braves or we want to live like the Ashers. They pretended like they wanted to live like the Dodgers and then they didn't really go that way. But they want to give out extensions to players when they're really young and they want to keep their payroll, you know, around the luxury tax. Maybe some years they'll push a little above, but they're not trying to be 30 or 40 million over like the Dodgers have been in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I think I'm back to uh, hating this team again. It's fair. It, it It's just, <laughs> I never thought, I, and I know it sounds repetitive. I just, I never thought Heim would make those kind of mistakes. And, and now he's owned it. Like the Globe article came out a couple months ago where they were basically like, yeah, we wish we had it back. It's just, if it was that clear to people who are Bobos and fans of the team, how is it not clear to the guy who's supposed to be unemotional and not care? Mm-hmm. It either seems like you were emotional or you were too scared of the PR. Which one is it? Because I don't think John Henry, I don't think John Henry's telling you five million one way or the other is going to decide everything. You trade JD, you trade JD. It's not a money thing. Where I am right now is like, I'm just, let's see how the rest of the offseason goes. Because I feel like this is a lot of, uh, like spring training starts tomorrow and this is what it is. Like I'm not ready to throw my hands up and say, wow, what went wrong this offseason? Uh, I think that there's still time on the clock. I'm interested to see, uh, especially now with Gene Segura going to the Marlins. Um, there, What was it? Uh, who had the report? The Red Are Sox it? had a deal with Colton Wong that fell through? Yes, that was Spear, which I, I hate to be that person, but um, Jerry Scoop Shop well, had that well before. Well before. Well, 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 well before. Well, well before. before. Well, well before. That was. Uh, I actually have another detail on that. That was. Uh, I think the the Brewers the Brewers or like ownership shut that deal down. Really? Yeah. So that yep. l- let's play this game per se. So that deal goes through. That's probably why you saw the coverage from the Red Sox in that Globe article in case that detail came out that they were still going to go after Xander even if Wong was here. They were definitely going to. So I can tell you the Red Sox had a deal for Colton Wong that got torpedoed by Brewers ownership. And this was before Xander signed with San Diego. And had the deal gone through, the Red Sox obviously were still going to pursue Xander even with Trevor Story. Because that would have been an insurance piece. And if they were able to sign Xander, they either would have found a way to use Wong or that's another piece that you can trade in another trade. So the plan was always to keep Xander. Well, Um, because they would have had leverage instead of where they are now, where it's quite clear they desperately need help up the middle. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It it, it was protection. And now you're sitting in the spot and to go off of that Gene Segura thing, Listen, I want Trevor Story at second base, but I didn't hate the idea of Gene Segura coming. Like, if you're going to just say, and Heim believes Story can play short, according to reports, it's other people in the organization that don't. You know, Gene Segura is above average defensively, can hit. You know, he's not a below average bat. It's a little above, a bit above league average, and he kind of fits into the profile we've talked about. He's not going to walk like some guys, but he doesn't strike out. Well, all right, you can picture a world where that kind of makes some sense. But uh, today we get the report. Here we go. Segura will likely be the Marlins opening day third baseman. Miami has had previous trade discussions on other middle infielders, Joey Wendell, uh, Miguel Rojas, as we've heard the last couple of weeks. But the Segura signing likely ends those conversations. So, all right, that's one side. Now we say, well, who knows? Maybe they go after Pablo Lopez. Uh, Miami has had ongoing conversations about trading starting pitching a ton. We've heard this for months, but they are adamant on acquiring a major upgrade to the 2023 lineup in any deal for their pitching. They are not chasing prospects. 
What major bat are you giving up in a lineup where you're looking, <laughs> where you still need middle of the order help? So I, I had this conversation recently about how, uh, how difficult the trade market is right now in Major League Baseball. And my theory was because of like social media. Social media makes the trade market so like infinitely more difficult to navigate as an executive because it's just every trade is being dissected everywhere. No one wants to lose a trade. And what happens is you have so many people that know the prospects inside and out in every organization. So what ultimately happens sometimes is if you're an executive, you find yourself asking yourself the question, am I making my team better or am I just moving players around? Like there's a lot of like I'm trading player X for player Y, but the value is almost the same. So like uh, of course there's the human element of um you know, this guy may not like playing in the Bronx and then he goes to Cincinnati and he loves it and he's comfortable and then he takes off and there he goes. Now he's so much better than he was in the Bronx. Uh, yes, that does happen. But I think, you know, in a lot of trades now, uh, just bodies are getting moved around because no one wants to give up too much. No one wants to look like an idiot. No one wants to say that they got fleeced. So the value in trades, like, you know, especially when you're talking about major league players, it's, it's less with prospects and more when you're moving around major league talent. Uh, that's when you kind of get like a, an offset of, well, did we really get better? Or did we just get a new name on the team? So I, I don't know. I feel like it, I just I would not envy being in not just Heim's position, but in any big league executive's dis, uh, position where that's that's your job is to make decisions like that because it's so hard to just win one. And and if you're not like like what's the worst part? It's like all right, if you don't win it, you'd at least like to have a tie. All right, well, does a tie make you better? Like if you're just offsetting players, does that make you a better team? No. So no. it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get one executive and another executive to agree to a trade where one team is looked at as a team that just got better. No, you're not wrong. And I think if you put yourself in Heim's shoes, you don't think there's a little PTSD there from the Hunter Renfro trade? How about the Jeffrey Springs trade? Mookie, as mm-hmm. we've talked about. Where, you know, you bet on Alex Pinellas and David Hamilton. Is anyone... Let's be real. Pinellas might not even make the big leagues. Sorry. Uh, you know, we saw what happened to him this past year. David Hamilton's probably the last guy on a roster. Speed guy especially with the new rules and everything. Are either of those players going to be as good as Hunter Renfro? No, probably not. Most likely not. Like Jeter Downs. Look at the outrage the day he got DFA'd. Like, look at it. People are calling that one of the worst trades of all time. I wouldn't go that far, but not great. Jeffrey Springs, not a prospect to the same degree, but the Red Sox say, hey, we're going to get Ronaldo Hernandez and Nick Sogard. Neither one of those guys are big leaguers. Like maybe Howard Ronaldo. Bruzar Gratterall looking at that bullpen right now. <clears throat> Exactly. And listen, I'm not a big Gratterall guy. He's a seventh inning guy, whatever. But it's I'm not I'm not either. It's, it's, but t- it's, it's like at least he'd be talent. here. He's a body. Exactly. Instead of it becoming nothing where, you know, we look at the Renfro trade. It's like, fuck, we gave away a player that would have without a doubt, no matter what you say, would have helped a big portion at this past season. And now you're going to have two guys who probably never really contributed at the big league level. And one of them, you can say, <laughs> was the reason that Ward was unprotected. Mm hmm. It's it's not easy, and I, if I'm just yeah, if if I'm if I'm other teams right now, like I feel like I'm gonna fuck the Red Sox. I'm like, you are so mm-hmm. desperate. <laughs> you are so desperate to make a deal right now. Like you need another part to at least fill a hole, but probably to try to figure out your foundation. You're willing to move Tanner Houck, so it's not going to be some trash ass player you're bringing in. You're not going to go probably get just a stopgap. You're hopefully shooting for more. We have the leverage. We know you need to make a move because look at your roster. You are not going into the season like that. Yeah. It's not I, I, I mean, I, again, I, I don't, I'm not looking forward to this. I'm not looking for, forward to the 2023 Boston Red Sox season. I'm not. Uh, but do I think I can stomach it? Yeah. They're not. Let's dude. see. What, what if? What if James Paxton looks pretty good. Like, like, look at Corey Kluber's season last year. 164 and change innings-ish. What if Paxton gives you that? What if Kluber gives you that? What if Sale gives you 125 innings? Like, you can mix and match your, your fucking boy, Garrett Whitlock. What if he becomes something? What if Bayo takes a step forward? Like, there's just... 
there's a lot of what if, and there's always what if on every single team, but I've just kind of put my, to, just to protect my peace, just to, just to, to, to save my mentals. I am a what if guy. I am a what if 2023 Boston Red Sox guy. And I know that that's probably not the smart road to take. I know that there are plenty of Red Sox fans out there that are like fire Heim Bloom, sell the team, uh, trade uh, fucking Rafael Devers and just start the rebuild and this and that. I-, I get that that's how a lot of people feel. How I choose to feel is what if. That's, that's how I feel about this team. Jake, how do you feel about this team? 2023 Boston Red Sox. Where are you at on this? I mean, there is a chance that they're absolutely nasty. <laughs> There's always a chance that they're nasty, Tyler. I feel I, I like disagree. right now you you are you are. I mean, you're not you're not you're not lying. You're not I'm spreading on the misinformation. Pos- Listen, I consider myself on the positive side. I, I think this <clears throat> team could win. You know, eighty five. I think you know. Let's call it by the end of the off season. I think they're going to be a team that's probably going to be better than five hundred. I think they're going to be like eighty three to eighty five wins. And they'll be exciting, but we'll look at it and say, all right, not as many things broke their way as like someone like the 2021 Red Sox or, you know, the up top level of the 2013. I don't, I'm not one of those people who thinks this team's going to be garbage. Not, not by any means. I just think they're going to be solid in a division that's really fucking good. I think they'll be better mm. than the Orioles. Look at the Orioles rotation and come back and talk to me. You want to talk about fucking question marks and not knowing? I, I'd love to see Jared. Jared, can you pull up the Orioles starting rotation sure. for me right now? Yeah, I know we're talking about who's going to finish in last place here, but you know, <laughs> you know, we got John Means coming back. Okay, that's had, true. That is Tommy true. John last year, right? Is that uh, John Means, Kyle Gibson, the Cream Machine, Dean yeah. Kramer, Kyle Bradish? Yeah. Are you looking at any of those guys and you're saying, oh, they're going to fuck up the Red Sox like that rotation, something crazy? Uh. Tyler Wells, Jordan Lyles, Austin Voth. No, this no. Okay. No. So they, like, what about when they add Michael Walker? Fuck Michael Walker. I'll take Corey Kluber over no. Michael Walker. Sorry. No, You'll no take disrespect. Who? Kluber? Yes, I would. I, as I said, <laughs> no disrespect. <laughs> fuck him. <laughs> I, I said it at the time when we were talking QLs. I wanted Evaldi to get one. I did not want to give one to Walker. There's a reason Walker's sitting on the market still after all this time. He doesn't have a QO attached to him. Think about it. You don't have to give anything up but money to get Michael Walker, but everyone realizes what he really is. He's like a four. He's a four or five guy who probably wants to get paid like a three. You're not getting that, buddy. I'm sorry. Maybe the Orioles will just so you can eat some innings, but you have injury Who's concerns on top of it. Uh, let's see. Michael Walker agent. I just think you look at Kluber and it's like, all right, I don't have to give him multiple years and you're getting basically the same profile. And it looks like he got a little unlucky last year and might end up being even a little bit better if you look at the FIP and stuff. He is uh, CAA Sports. Is that how you say that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason Walk is still sitting out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll take the older pitcher with a similar profile and metrics that point to him being even a little better than the guy who also has injury concerns and every metric points to him being, you know, Easily a back of the rotation guy. Kluber at his worst so what's, was the back of the rotation guy. What's left for them to do? Like it's like, oh, we wanted to add a starter. Corey Kluber's here. Cool. Is that as you call it an offseason with the with the rotation? Or are you still looking to upgrade there? So let me tell you this. I, I think there is a real conversation. Now, Alex Spear reported yesterday that when asked if they were going to rock a six man rotation, I think the wording was extremely unlikely. Chad Den- Jennings had it a little bit less than that. He was like, oh, we'll see what it looks like at the end. But Spear said that directly. Just not something they're really looking at. Sale, Kluber, Whitlock, Bayo, Pavetta, Paxton. Yeah, six starters. And that's not even including Hauk, who they continue to try to sell as a starter. Hmm. There's I mean, going to be a deal. How, how fucking, how excited would you have been if you had Chris Sale and Corey Kluber in your rotation five years ago. Cream everywhere. Mm-hmm. Lots of cream. All the cream. Like 2016, the 2016 Boston Red Sox had Corey Kluber and Chris Sale in their rotation. And James Paxton? Like, we're throwing yeah. a party. We, we have yeah, probably yeah. the best trio in the league. But now we yeah. have People like... People are comparing that to like the Phillies when they had fucking Halliday and Cliff Lee and Oswalt and... That's basically what it 
same tier. Yeah. And, you know, we have a lot of guys. Sale, we'll see. You know, I, I think Sale still, if he can stay healthy, I don't think he's going to be like a four ERA guy. I think as we've seen when he's been healthy the last two years, he can still pitch. I don't think we'll ever see ace Chris Sale again, unfortunately. But all right, let's call it a three five or a three six. That would go a long way right now, would it not? Mm-hmm. Can Kluber match his fit from this past year? Can it be like a three five? Let's just call it a three eight, three nine. Mm-hmm. I'll take that. Uh, I'm you know, more you can, worried about innings than I am about ability. And that's the that's the reality because Garrett Whitlock, like maybe a hundred innings, Chris Sale. A hundred. I'm worried about counting innings. stats, not rate stats. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the big problem right now. That mm-hmm. means guys well, I mean, like that's Cro- why you got six guys. You got more than that. And that's why I get mad when I'm like, I'd prefer if they looked for trades for someone like Pavetta. But isn't this a way around it? Like you have true uh, legit six starting pitchers. Why not stretch this out as much as we can here? You're still asking too much from a lot of these guys here. But Correct. wouldn't that make your life easier? Or are you that obsessed about having another bullpen? <laughs> how, how crazy is that? Like, seriously, like Paxton, Sale, Kluber, if this were 2016, we would, this podcast would be like, fucking World Series. Like, that's, we would literally be doing that right now. We would actually be doing that with these guys. Paxton, Sale, Kluber, all in the same rotation. Are you fucking kidding me? It doesn't matter if the Red Fuck Sox can score runs. Like, that is a three headed monster that has taken us to the World Series. And now here we are in 2023 when it's like, all right, so we need to probably add another starter or two. <laughs> like legitimately having that conversation. Kluber, Sale, Paxton. And we're like, fuck, what do we do about this? <laughs> if you want to be Mr. Positive, which we're, we're trying to do, I guess if you're Garrett Whitlock and Brian Bayo, could you really ask for like a better trio of guys to learn from? Including, you know, Bayo spending time with Pedro right now, which yeah. uh, who knows? Maybe Bale shows up this upcoming year and he says, fuck you. I'm about to become one of the best pitchers in baseball. Is it out of the question? No. Garrett Whitlock? Garrett Whitlock, I think, is going to be a very good number three starter. Um, <clears throat> get over it. That's what we're hoping I mean, he's for. Not, he's, not, he's not a number three starter. He's not. What is he? What is he? Uh, he's a reliever is what he is. No, no, no. What is he? He's a starter. Do we, have a, do we have like a bet that he's going to end up in the bullpen by the end of the year? Can we like make that bet if we don't already have it? Yeah, let's make a bet and let's put an ERA number on it as well. No, I'm I'm just saying like he will end the season in the bullpen. Well, or he okay. will he will be demoted to the bullpen at some point in 2023. Would you count like say we get to August and they're they're still pretty competitive? They're trying something not like a limiting innings thing. Like okay, a, hey, this isn't working out. All right, yeah, I'd bet you he's not going to get demoted. It won't be a demotion. Okay. Well, what's the bet? What are you going to do to me? What do I get out of you, Jared? <laughs> what do you want? I don't know. I, I want a shirt made that says Tyler was right with Garrett Whitlock's face on it. I'll do that. And I need some pictures on the social media. I'll change my and profile I, picture to that picture. Uh, oh, my God. This is great. What else can I add to the shirt? Jake, you got any ideas? What can I add to the shirt? I feel like we should sell it, to be honest. Interesting. <laughs> this is good. I think people <laughs> would enjoy wearing a Tyler was right shirt with Garrett Whitlock's face on it. Yeah, maybe. Can you imagine me standing next to Garrett Whitlock, arm arm around him up top because he's taller than me. I'm 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 a short king, but mm-hmm. that kind of situation that that mm-hmm. sounds pretty great to me. And I think I'd like it, it on awesome. the field at Fenway. Okay. And maybe you, you in the that? background looking hurt, like upset, but you really have to wear it because I know it would bother you, but I would really want it to bother you. All right, I can do that. <clears throat> I have what's, to think about what I the, want from you. I. What could you possibly do for me? I don't know. I am a lower tier human. <laughs> what can I offer you, Jared? <laughs> Jared, what do you want from me? Uh, You're not going to feel anything good by being right over me. It's just like, all right, I was right over Tyler Milliken. Who gives a fuck? Uh, maybe I'll make you clean my house. Okay. Do I have to wear? Oh, yeah. don't tell me. I'll make you wear a maid outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, I'll make what, you clean you- my house wearing a maid outfit. Would you order me like a larger one or would it be the same one you would have ordered for Dallas? Just like a tight one. Okay. Like a skimpy one. <laughs> would, would this be recorded? Yes. Okay. Like a, like a naughty little maid outfit. Okay. Listen. Yeah. I'm working on my for body being, this year. For being naughty, for, for thinking that, that, that uh, <clears throat> Garrett Whitlock was going to. So turned on, you can't think. Rotation all year. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. I think this is a fair bet. Okay. Be positive. If the Red Sox are going anywhere, Garrett Whitlock's going to have to be, or he's going to need to be a big part of it. I'm being positive. I just, it's not even that I don't think that, eh, no, it is. I don't think that he's going to work on the rotation. It's more that I just want him in the bullpen. Like I just, but I'm not having this debate again. No, at this point, we're at wait and see mode. Yeah. Now I do have a question for you though. Okay. Exactly. Now we didn't really hit on it. We talked Chris a little Christmas morning. We get the John Mm -hmm. Heyman tweet that Mm -hmm. the Red Sox are willing to listen on Chris sale. First Mm -hmm. off, who drops a report on Christmas morning? Absolutely uncalled for. Mm -hmm. What do you, what was your, from what you're hearing from what you've talked to, is it John Heyman bullshit? Because, you know, Sale isn't a Boris guy. Nope. So what is, why, do, why are we hearing this? Where did that come from? Um, I, I mean, I heard the Cardinals were one of the teams that were interested. Uh, I don't know what the Red Sox willingness would be to do that. I mean, I guess if, if you don't want to end up paying that contract say if there's a team that's like yeah we'll take them then you, you do it but uh i didn't hear much about that and if it's legit if there's any real smoke there if it's the red sox just being like hey a lot of teams are calling us about chris sale right now if you guys if you want to get in the mix he's going fast and like no teams are calling and then you get like some dumb team that's like what we gotta get in the sale sweepstakes and they they're in the 2017 like, yeah. levels <gasps> i don't know we got we got like three different offers that are better than that on the table yeah i i don't know <laughs> because he's not a boris guy um there's got to be some angle there because i don't if if you like if you're a team that's looking to contend, are, are you trying to get the Red Sox to pay for that and then send him to you for like a prospect or something? Are you are you a team that's like, hey, we'll take on his contract because we believe in his ability to bounce back? Like, like what is what's the angle there? It that that's where I'd be confused. It's like, all right, well, if you're the Red Sox and you're saying, you know, it is what it is. This is going to be a bridge year. If you deal him right now. You, and, you know, a team is going to, you're going to get that contract off your books when it's as low as it's going to be. You're going to have to attach something to get that deal done. Like, no one's going to just take that contract to take that contract. And if you're already in a bridge year where money's really not a problem, you're not going over the luxury tax. Wouldn't it be better to just to say, fuck it, let's just get to August and maybe he proves he's still a mid-rotation guy and we can actually get some value back here. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you're contending, if you're like, hey, we actually want to try and compete, say in a world where somehow they end up going over the luxury tax, it's like, oh, no, we need to hang on to Chris Sale because he has some of the upside that really nobody else in this rotation besides Bayo or Whitlock, if he pops, has. It it doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. from either angle. And then you have the people who are like, are we about to relive the Mookie Betts, David Price trade? Where they attach Sale to Devers and they ship him out. But I would say... Well, they were in financial hell when they did that. That's why they did that. And you would hope they would have learned their lesson after getting a shit return. Or not a shit return, but a lesser return that turned out to be shit. Yes or no? Chris Sale on the team still on opening day? Yes. Yeah. Jake? Yeah. Yeah. That's not something I'm particularly concerning myself with. Unless, unless they pull off a trade... Uh, for a pitcher and sale is somehow involved in that deal. Like, I don't think that I don't think that sale is going out unless another starter is coming in at some point, whether it's the same deal or a separate deal. That'd be a weird yeah. trade. That'd be with weird money. It'd have to be another contract coming back. Like or... a dumb. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Something like. Uh, like Yelich. With burns or something like that. I like the yellowish idea, but and I, I hate to be that guy. It feels like it got killed when Yoshida came here. Hmm. You Unless can't make they Yelich. still plan on trading for Dugo. But could you play Yelich in right field? No. Yeah. Not at this point? That's where he plays. Yeah. At Fenway Park, though. Yeah. I'd be concerned about Christian Yelich playing right field at Fenway Park. 
Nah, he's got this. I don't know. I don't know. How many games did he play in right field last year? Enough. Is that true? Yeah. He played left field <laughs> exclusively last year. Did he play... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, did he play right field when he came to Fenway? Why do I think he played right field when he came to Fenway this year? Uh, what days were that? I don't remember. Jared, wake the fuck up. Hold on. Do you remember the month? No. June? I got it. Uh, July. Good effort. Nope, he played in left mm. field those days. Mm. It's tough. Hey, Yelich, <laughs> if you well, whatever's up with your back, fuck it. Just go play right field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what, are you going to kill Justin Turner and make Yoshida the DH? Like, <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I've ruined Jared's mood. Jared came in here feeling slightly good, and I, I feel bad. I just, I'm still in wait and see mode before I get to fully what if mode. Like, I need to, <clears throat> I need to, uh, th- we can't be done. This isn't, the Red Sox are not done making moves. Nope. There's going to be a moment where we probably have to film or record an emergency podcast because a massive deal happened. That brings some clarity, probably doesn't push them over the luxury tax. Um, but we'll be like, all right, they got another foundation piece here. Massive deal. Sure. Blockbuster. Hmm. You think a blockbuster deal is coming? I don't know. Uh, I'd say a big deal. Blockbuster is probably going too far. But if it's like Tanner Houck plus something, you should be able to get something. Like Houck plus Verdugo plus Rafaela. Or York. I, I will say this because there might be some people listening to the podcast right now. They're like, guys, the Red Sox are not tr- going to be involved in a massive deal. That's just not what this team is anymore. They're the Tampa Bay Rays now. They don't make massive deals. I'll say this. If a deal doesn't happen, it's not because of a lack of effort. If, if a massive deal, if a, if a deal To bring in, let's call it a star player, doesn't happen. It's not because the Red Sox didn't make the phone call. I don't like that. Get it done. Like, Bob, Bob, uh, listen, it it takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. It's not about the Red Sox, you know, picking up the phone to call a team about player X and then just not ponying up what it would cost. Some teams just don't want to part ways with certain stars. You do got to match up. And like we're talking about with the Marlins, like it looks like they don't match up. And we at one point thought they did. Might not match up too well with the Pirates. Who knows? But you're kind of in a spot here where it's like, yeah, it takes two to tango, but you also put yourself in this position. And sometimes when you put yourself into a corner, you have to pay those dues for getting put in a corner. Hmm. It's not always the last thing that happens to you. That's your fault. But what led up to it? It can be. It usually is. That was a bar. That was a bar. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I, I, I'm going to uh, the Wilbur tonight to see Bob Marley. Bob Marley? Yep. Isn't he dead? The musician is, yes. Oh. There is a comedian by the name of Bob Marley. R.I.P. R.I.P. Um, Jake, any uh, Jake's takes? I'm just happy for dipshit, man. I think Yankees fans are really going to love him. <laughs> dipshit ruined 628. So yeah, fuck people him. don't talk about that enough. People do not talk about that enough. Um, hey, uh, thanks to all the listeners out there. It's the last episode of 2022. Uh, season sucked. The offseason has been worse. Depend. I, I don't, yeah, it sucked. It it's sucked. not like, finished. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's it's not over, but like losing Xander sucks. It sucks a lot. Yeah, I'm still upset about it. Um, but as far as going from one place to another, which feels like an eternity at this point, like I feel like I've been at DraftKings for far longer than a year. 
which is nice. That means I'm comfy. It means I feel like I'm at home. But for the listeners who have come from Section 10, it's a name redacted. Uh, we appreciate you guys. It's only going to get better. It's only going to get better uh, because there's going to be more interviews this upcoming season. Uh, hopefully, we can get Coley in the mix a little bit more. Maybe Pat will want to participate more than three times a season. Uh, Pete, obviously, once hockey is over, will be back in the mix. Tyler doesn't miss a fucking episode. Jake's here uh, every single week. So I think um, you know we're just getting started here with uh, the name Redacted Pod. And uh, did I did I hear this correct, Jake? Are we getting new uh, graphics? Are we getting are we getting new logo? Yeah, it should be in January sometime. January is just a few days away. So, um, <clears throat> with new logos means new merch. We didn't really put out merch because I knew that that wasn't like the Jared Carabas podcast. That wasn't going to be the name of the podcast uh, moving forward. So, I didn't want people running around with Jared Carabas podcast t shirts. I was like, I don't, I don't like any of that. But uh, yeah, 2023, what if? What if? Tyler, any any final words? What if? If we're talking what ifs, January, January 2023 will be when we mm-hmm. figure out whether they can get a trade done and whether they can get Rafael Devers extended. So either mm-hmm. in a month, we will be more depressed than we ever were at any point in 2022, possibly at the point of throwing ourselves off the monster, or we'll be mm-hmm. sitting here and saying, what if? What if? With optimism and knowing Devers is going to be here. But in the next month, we will know whether it's way worse than we ever thought it was or, all right, it's actually not that bad. And with that, there's only uh, four words that I want to leave you with as we close out the year. Garrett Whitlock is a starter. What? Wait, that's five. Sorry. Continue. <clears throat> Let's go Red Sox. Let's, Let's go, go Red Sox. Sox. Let's, Let's go, go Red Sox. Sox. Go Red Sox. Buenas noches, amigos. <laughs>